In this example, we're going to start looking at more complicated embedding of loops. In this case, we have three for loops that are nested together. We're going to see how that complicates things that we want to do. So these are for loops. And conveniently, the stuff happening on the inside is, takes constant time. So we can express this all just as a summation. So t of n is equal to. We can express this as three different summations the sum from i equals 1 to n coming from the outermost loop, the sum from j equals 1 to i coming from the middle loop, and the sum from k equals j to i from the innermost loop. And the cost of one iteration is c. Let us move this down to make it a little easier. Let's begin by simplifying that innermost summation. So we still have the sum from i equals 1 to n, and the sum from j equals 1 to i of c times the top bound minus the bottom bound plus 1. So we get i minus j plus 1 inside of there. Now, there are several ways we could try to proceed. You could try to break up the summation and do things like that. I'm going to encourage us to just start bounding this and see what happens. So let's try and bound this above. So we're going to upper bound. To upper bound this, we need to choose the value of j that makes the innermost summation as large as possible. This inner summation is decreasing with j. As I plug in bigger values of j, bigger values of j I am subtracting larger and larger values. So the value of j that would make it the biggest would be the smallest value that j takes. So that long-winded explanation is to say I can make it bigger by keeping everything the same but replacing j with the smallest value it takes, which is 1. And that looks really convenient because now I have a minus 1 and a plus 1, and those will cancel in a nice way. So we have the sum from i equals 1 to n of the sum. I've lost a c somewhere along the way. The sum from j equals 1 to i of c i. Now we need to be careful. Our summation index for that innermost summation is j. No j's are appearing. So we can just evaluate how many times that loop occurs. So this is less than or equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of, we have i copies of ci or ci squared. And now you could try to use a formula to evaluate what ci squared is, but we've already given up hope on an exact answer. So there's really no downside to just keep bounding and make our arithmetic easier. So this is less than or equal to the sum i equals 1 to n of cn squared. That's adding up a fixed thing, a cn squared, a fixed number of times, n times. So this is just equal to cn cubed. So all the stuff in red there is simply telling me that I am in big O of n cubed. Now we should also bound this below. We need to be careful when bounding below. I'm going to do this a bit slowly to make sure we see what's happening. So we're going to lower bound it. Let's do that over here. I'm going to begin by splitting that j summation in half and seeing where that leads me. So t of n equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of I'm splitting the j summation in half and having it go from 1 to i over 2 of c times i minus j plus 1 plus the sum from j equals i over 2 plus 1 to i of c i minus j plus 1. And just like we had to be careful with the upper bound, we also need to be careful with the lower bound. We need to ensure that we keep the larger of those two summations. So because it is a decreasing function of j, the larger of the two would be the first, and that means we're throwing out the second. 
So this is greater than or equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of the sum from i j equals 1 to i over 2. I'm going to do one additional thing here, which is I'm going to throw out all of those second half of the terms, the second summation. And I'm also going to drop that plus 1 that's inside of the summation. That makes every term smaller by 1, and that definitely makes the overall summation smaller. I'm now going to plug in the value of j that makes that the smallest. So that value of j would be the largest value of j, which is i over 2. The sum from i equals 1 to n. The sum from j equals 1 to i over 2. And we are plugging in j equals i over 2. Let's do a bit of simplification really quick. That's equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of the sum from j equals 1 to i over 2 of c i over 2. Just like we saw with the upper bound, that innermost summation no longer has any j's inside of it, so now we have an easy simplification for our next step. It's equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of, we have i over 2 terms of ci over 2, so that's ci squared over 4. Now let's try and get a bit better at doing these things sort of quickly. Let's try and drop half of the terms. I'm going to drop the first half of the terms because this is an increasing function of i. So I'm going to keep the sum from i equals n over 2 plus 1 to n of c i squared over 4. Dropping that first half of the summation, similar to what we did up here, but we've done it more quickly. Now let's plug in a value of i that makes this convenient. One such value of i, let's draw a better summation. One such value of i would be n over 2, sum from i equals n over 2 plus 1 to n of c times n over 2 quantity squared, all over 4. Now we've eliminated all of the loop variables from the summations, so now all we need to do is simply do the arithmetic to simplify. There are n over 2 terms there, and we have c n squared over 2 squared and 4 combined to give me a 16 there. So all of that mess in green looks like it's led me to the conclusion that I am in big omega of n cubed. So t of n is in big omega of n cubed. It's in big omega of n cubed and big O of n cubed, so it must be in theta of n cubed. That's my conclusion. So t of n is in theta of n cubed. However you choose to analyze these is up to you, and I will not necessarily care how you do it. I will encourage you to use the bounding methods because they tend to be more universally helpful. But whatever technique you prefer, you are allowed to use for problems like this.